you fellows for joining us today. Um, I appreciate this, especially so close to the holidays. I know it can be tough timing, but I think this is really good timing, especially coming off of the DC trip. It's always good to see your faces again, but um, coming off the DC trip and going into holidays with learning how to blog. Um, Betsy came to me with this idea and I think it's a great idea and opportunity for her to share with you. Um, we also have a guest with us today, Amber Bryce Girdle. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce Betsy first for those of you who may not be familiar with who she is. She is the founder of Be Creative Consulting LLC, an online marketing and publication consulting firm based out of Washington, D.C. She has been blogging about desserts, travel, and military life for 10 years at the Java Cup blog where she has successfully grown from a hobby blog to a globally recognized publisher and influencer. Betsy works full-time as the Wounded Hero Caregiver Program Director at Operation Gratitude and is a Dole Fellow. Um, and she's a Dole Fellow for DC, I should add. She lives in Northern Virginia with her husband, two kids, and their brand new Corgi puppy, which you have to show us that puppy before this is over. Don't worry, I will. <laughs> <laughs> And then joining us today is the wonderful Amber Bryce Girdle, Grace Girdle, who is the co-founder of Media Vine, managing editor for foodfanatic.com, co-host of the podcast Theory of Content, and author behind bluebonnetbaker.com. Her primary focus is at Media Vine, a full service and management company that allows content creators to build content for their websites while Media Vine fully manages their advertising efforts. She loves Tex-Mex, baking, and her British husband, two boys as well, where they live in San Antonio. Um, so thank you, Amber, and thank you, Beth. Yes. I will make one note. This is an interactive call. Usually I mute all of you, um, but this one we want you to, you know, just mute yourselves. If, if you're not going to be involved, that's fine. Just avoid any background noise, but definitely feel free to unmute and chime in when needed. So, great. Ben, take it away. Thanks awesome. for that awesome introduction, Liz. Absolutely. Yeah, so I have been, like this, said, I've been blogging for 10 years, and um, every time I go up to the hill, I'm always like, I have so many things I want to share with the world, and I, this last time, I was thinking, so are all these other fellows. All the other fellows are going to have all these things inside of them they want to share, um, and I want to take what I know about blogging and share that with you. Um, and then I thought, what better way to do that than, te than bring in who's taught me all the things I know about blogging and bring Amber from Mediavine in. So Mediavine, um, on my website, the Java Cupcake blog, they manage all of um, my ads that run on my blog. But more than that, um, Mediavine has created a place for me as a blogger to become part of a community that um, supports one another as well as Mediavine also educates me as a blogger in what um, the latest trends are and what I can do to make my blog as successful as possible. Um, so that's why Amber is here. Hi everybody. It's wonderful to be here and that was so nice to hear Betsy. Mm -hmm. It's like that's everything that we want Mediavine to be for everybody that we work with and to know that that's happening is just it makes me I'm like the Grinch. My heart just grew three sizes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, just to introduce myself, um, I've been a blogger um, for just as long as Betsy has. My own personal website sort of took a backseat about five years ago. Um, you'll notice it if you ever visit it, it hasn't been updated in two years. Um, but I still run uh, foodfanatic.com, which is uh, Mediavine's website. We, we actually own three websites ourselves. Um, the Hollywood Gossip, which you may have visited it. It's the biggest Hollywood gossip website on the web. Um, we also have TV Fanatic and then Food Fanatic, which I still run to this day. Um, and then our, our biggest efforts are actually in um, helping content creators to turn their passions into a business that can help support their families. And as someone who is the grandchild of two different uh, uh, 
of service vets. Um, my, both my grandfathers were uh, in the military, one army, one air force, who boy. Um, but they, uh, they instilled a lot of care for the armed services in me throughout my life. And so I'm just so excited to be here to, to help you guys because I would love to see you be able to start a blog and, and have it become a business. And it's a business that can go with you wherever you're stationed. Um, and so you don't have to give up uh, something that you've put a lot of heart, effort and heart into um, every time you, you get stationed somewhere new, which to me is just a wonderful thing. That's great, Amber. Thank you. Um, so we're going to jump right in. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. We've put together a presentation for you. It's, um, it's not just going to be us talking at you the whole time. There'll be some stuff we share with you, but it's going to be interactive like Liz said. Um, all right, I've shared my screen. Can everybody see it? Liz, Amber, yes. Okay, good. All right, so um, let's jump right in. So we've done our introductions, and there's me and Amber. You can see here, um, those are all the places we're at. So you'll get a copy of this slide deck afterwards. So don't worry about having to write everything down right now because you'll get it, you'll get it later. Um, okay, so this is where I want to know a little bit about you. What kind of blogs do you read or what kind of blogs do you think are out there? What types are they? So just tell me what kind of blogs you've read or what you know about blogs. Well, I tuned in because I need to know more. So, because I don't even know what blogs to read. So that's why I'm on. Uh... I'm, I'm with Liz. I don't really know much about it. I know I was asked to write a blog and I got really nervous because I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> so. Okay. You know, I, I'm going to chime in here and say, I bet there are plenty of people uh, here that have read a blog and don't realize that they're reading a blog. Uh, if you've yeah. ever read an article on scary mommy, you're reading a blog. If you've ever read anything on Huffington post that started as a blog. Um, oh, yeah. yeah so, uh, so have you ever made a recipe off of Pinterest? Like you've gone to Pinterest and found a craft or DIY? That's most likely a blog as well that you have found on Pinterest. Oh. So yeah. blogs come in all shapes and forms. Um, so to kind of break it down kind of simply, I've kind of put the different kind of blogs in three different categories. There are personal blogs, um, meaning that's where somebody shares just for themselves, almost like a diary. Um, and it's just, there's, it's, like it says, to reach a broader audience and to fulfill a personal goal. Um, and then there's corporate and business blogs. And this is where, for example, um, Operation Gratitude, where I work, I will write um, for Operation Gratitude's blog, but it's with um, Operation Gratitude's audience in mind. So I'm writing about who we're helping through our organization. And I'm thinking about the donors when I'm writing. And I'm thinking about potential volunteers or I'm thinking about um, caregivers who want to receive boxes. So um, if you think about a company like um, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, they would be blogging to share your stories or to share the mission of the organization. Um, so businesses, um, a blog is a great opportunity for them to control what the narrative of their brand and their story and, um, and reach out to the audience in a more personal way. Right. And I mean, I'll, I'll chime in and say Mediavine has a blog as well that all of the four co-founders write for as well as our employees. And we even sometimes get in uh, our customers uh, in for guest blogging. But the ultimate goal is to reach either potential customers or customers who are already with us, but may not be um, doing things the way that would make them the most money. That's why we write things for our blog to sort of point to a place where they can read at their own leisure um, information that would help them get to a new level of, of uh, income or a new level of blog traffic or whatever the case may be. The, finally, um, the third type that I've, um, you know, brand, a list out here is influencer or um, that's what kind of I do. So I am a food blogger 
that's what I've been doing for 10 years. And mine started out as a hobby, but it turned into, um, it turned into a money maker for me. And part of that is, um, is utilizing my audience, um, as kind of, I can influence them through my blog or through my social media. So I partner with brands to, they, they, they pay me for sponsored posts. Um, and then I use my content to influence my readers. Um, you'll see a lot of influencers on Instagram, for example. There's a lot of influencers. Kim Kardashian is an influencer. She's paid a lot of money to share through her social media um, the different products that she uses. Um, but blogs are also an influence on society. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, baking and kitchen brands. So I've worked with uh, the kitchen brand OXO um, or OXO, as some people like to call it. And, you know, they'll send me product and I'll use it and then talk about it in my blog. Um, the best influencers are the ones that are authentic and their voice comes across as being true and real and believable. So I'm not going to block about blog about you know, workout equipment just because some, um, you know, Bowflex wants to give me one because that doesn't fit my brand. So an influencer is only successful when their audience can believe and buy into what they are trying to sell. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we work with um, influencers across the lifestyle spectrum. So anything from food bloggers like Betsy to um, finance it, personal finance is a huge blogging niche that people wouldn't realize. I personally did not realize until I went to a finance blogger conference and there were more than 2000 attendees. Um, there's uh, parenting and uh, diet, like someone mentioned in the chat, diet blogs. Um, if you've ever read uh, Skinny Taste uh, is quite a popular diet blog. Uh, she is an influencer. She, she is a blog. She's a real human um, that started her blog 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Her name's Gina. But a lot of people don't realize that Skinny Taste is actually a human and not this like massive, um, massive uh website. Um, you would, Steph, to answer your question, she says, I've wanted to start a caregiver life blog for a while. Is that personal? I'd love for it to become an income stream too. And I, to answer this question, I think really um, it depends on how you go into it. A lot of people start their blogs as a personal blog. I personally did that. I wanted a way to, um, to, uh, document the, the recipes I was making from my grandmother, um, when I was living overseas. Um, and it eventually turned into a moneymaker for me the same way that Betsy's did. I'm sure that Betsy did the exact same thing, went into it, um, as an income stream and, or as a, as a personal thing that turned into an income stream. Um, but this is exactly what we're here to talk to you about because these days knowing that you can turn this into a business, go into it thinking of yourself as a brand and a business from the start. It doesn't mean you're not authentic. It doesn't mean you're not telling a true story. But if you think about it from the business, as a business from the start, you are absolutely going to be able to monetize long-term and still share your story. Yeah, so that, that goes directly into our next point, Steph. So thank you so much for asking that. Um, you know, one of our fellow fellows that does that really well is Patty Catter. Um, a lot of us know Patty. She was at the convening with us a few weeks ago. Um, but Patty blogs. She's been blogging for 10 years, but she also has branded herself kind of as this influencer. Um, so... She, on, you can see on the screen share that I've just, you know, posted a picture of her Instagram and she has branded her Instagram as being kind of not just Patty's personal page, but this is Patty's official public page of her. Um, so she has done, a, she's a really good example of a fellow who is, who is doing this already. She's um, thought of herself in the, in the big picture and is presenting herself that way. Um, across her blog and her social media. And, you know, one thing that um, I really want to point out is that um, I, my brand, 
uh, has evolved and changed over the years. So, uh, and, and it doesn't, and my brand is never, has never just been one thing. So you don't have to get yourself into this niche that's so narrow and stay there. You can make your brand as encompassing as you want it to be. People are going to always find something within you that they can connect and believe and believe in, you know? Um, well, Amanda, your, Amanda comments in the chat, she says she's one in 5.5 million caregivers and she doesn't think she's interesting enough to blog. But the thing is that even though there are five and a half million caregivers, Amanda, your individual story is one that's unique and is one that people will find aspects of it that they can resonate with. Um, and so that there are people out there that aren't capable or don't have the means or the ab uh, ability to share their story on a blog. But Amanda, if you can, then what you share is going to reach somebody else who needs to hear that at that moment. Absolutely. Ask Betsy how many food bloggers there are. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> there are so many food bloggers. Yeah, I mean, it's sure. <laughs> people talk all the time about food blogging being oversaturated. And the truth is that you, every person is unique and every person has the ability to get an audience in front of them that wants to know their story. Um, if, if there were only so much traffic to go around or only so many audience members to go around, Betsy and myself would not have any views. Uh, because there'd be people like the pioneer woman, right? Who we think are getting all of them, but one person can visit 20 blogs. So it, it really don't get yourself, don't stop yourself from, from putting yourself out there. Like if you have something to say, it's not going to be an overnight thing, but absolutely you, you have the ability to find an audience. Colleen asks if she should approach the blog, the blog as a brand with a, a business plan and tie the social media platforms together. Um, and I'd say, yes, absolutely think absolutely. of it as a business. Uh, if you seriously want to write and you want to share your story, then absolutely think of it as a business. Um, and, and that kind of leads into this next kind of, um, point that I want to talk about with you guys is you know, what is the importance of blogging? And we've talked about the stories that we have to share. Um, and and that's, that's kind of where it all starts. You have these things inside of you that you want to share, um, but you don't really know how or know why. Well, sharing those stories will build a community, right? And if you're building a brand within that, sharing those stories will allow you to become an authority within that industry. And that's what's great for business, businesses and companies as well. Um, like Amber talked about how Mediavine's blog shares um, kind of an educational component. Well, that makes them um, an authority and a leader within their industry because they share those things. And you can do that as well within the caregiver community. Sharing your story makes you an authority on the subject. Um, it's also a great way to build your professional network. I've met so many diverse people through blogging. Um, there are online blogging communities that I'm a part of, and you know, I've met Amber through blogging, and this would not have happened without my blog. Um, so you can build not only your personal, but your professional network. Um, and then finally, what I think was, is unique with our community is that blogging will allow us to create some kind of social change. Um, and you can see with what the foundation has done already, um, just in these last few years of being in existence, think about if we all started sharing our stories on blogs, what kind of an impact that would make even more. Um, so there's a real opportunity here for um, us as, as Dole Fellows to share our stories and really kind of continue on the Hidden Heroes movement and create more social change. Absolutely. One, one point that I wanted to make on this, Betsy, is um, everybody knows Joanna Gaines, right? Yeah. <laughs> started as a guest blogger on a, a, a DIY blogs website. She guest blogged one time for an established DIY blog and the um, HGTV saw it and approached her. And that's how that brand was built. Now imagine that I'm doing, I'm with, this, with the social, with the social change aspect, like, 
to me there it's so exciting like it just gives me chills the idea of you guys creating these websites that get the the stories out there that make people really understand the things that you're going through it's it's impossible that that wouldn't somehow affect social change in the same way that you know chip and joanna Gaines doing things to to lift up the city of waco mm -hmm. has changed the city of waco and i can say that as a texan who has been there both before and after like there are ways to affect social change no matter how you're going at it um and so it's to me it's just super super exciting one of the kind of things that I always tell people when they think about blogging um, is that blogging allows you to control the narrative of the brand and your story. So if you don't want somebody else telling your story, blogging is the opportunity for you to do it for yourself. Um, I love this for, um, for companies as well. I think a lot of companies and businesses lose the opportunity on their blogs because they're not blogging to control the narrative of their brand and their story. So, um, for example, through Operation Gratitude, I'm really trying hard to use the blog to really tell the caregiver story. Um, and so it gives me the chance to let people know or tell people what I want them to know about Operation Gratitude. And you can do that the same for your brand as well. What is the narrative that you want people to know about you and your brand? So, here are a, little st a few little stats from Tech Client and HubSpot that I just wanted to show you um, about like the importance of blogging. Um, if you have a blog as a part of your website, you are 434% more likely to be ranked on search engines if you don't have a blog. That's huge, right? That's, that's huge. Um, and 67% of blogs or websites that have blogs create more leads than those that don't. And a lead is, could be anything from, um, you know, a potential donor to a potential partner, um, to sponsored partnerships, really anything that would generate you more income revenue or even partnerships or collaborations that would be considered a lead. So blogging has been proven to be beneficial to brands and businesses. So when thinking about blogging, you really want to, as a, you know, think about your, who your audience is going to be. And I kind of put this list together based on who I thought our audience would be as caregivers. Um, obviously other caregivers, um, family and friends, um, but then there's, you know, other nonprofit organizations. Um, uh, perhaps there's, you know, um, an org that you've been wanting to work with. So maybe you write about them in one of your posts and your experiences with them. Um, maybe you're trying to get your local um, government to um, make some changes in your community. Well, you can use your blog to write about that and maybe hopefully connect with that audience of your local lawmakers. Same with other community partners. And then if you just turn your, your blog into a nonprofit, then you can get potential donors through your blog as well. And so you have to be thinking about they could be my audience. Um, and, and finally, media. Um, uh, the blogs are, are a great way to share your, your, your narrative um, easily across the internet and a lot of media outlets will read those stories and potentially do stories about you in media. Um, so you want to be thinking about who your audience is when you are, um, you know, thinking about what you want to write about. All right, so great. So we want to blog, right? We're all excited about it. We have an idea. But now what? Like, okay, great. <laughs> what do we do next? Okay, so I this is gonna be a really high level overview of what to do next. So um, I'm gonna be sharing resources at the end with you for you to continue to do more, um, you know, reading up on it yourself, um, and then I'll be available to help you later with you know more specific questions. Um, so these are the four basic steps for starting a blog in 2018, almost 2019, okay? Um, the first step is to choose and set up a blogging platform, domain, and hosting. So a domain is the URL, the www.whatever, okay? So for mine, it's javacupcake.com. The hosting is 
the company that like houses the actual website itself. So for example, um, I use GoDaddy for my hosting, but there are a lot of other options. Um, and then the platform is um, what you use to actually create your blog. So I use WordPress. And I know that Amber and I have talked about, um, you know, there are a lot of options out there, but going forward, WordPress um, is really what we recommend. It's, it's, uh, it's the best for site speed and um, for mobile um, and kind of all things that you want to be looking at when you're creating a website. It's just, it's just really the top one out there right now. Something like 25% of the internet is on WordPress. So um, it really is the best blogging software that you can use. Um, out of the box, it is uh, the most SEO friendly, search engine optimization friendly, um, which means you don't have to spend as much time figuring out what SEO means or what, uh, what it means to, to, to create your website in a way that means Google picks it up or uh, Bing picks it up, um, which to me is invaluable. Um, if, you know, if your, if your goal is to get eyeballs looking at your website, WordPress is really where it's at. So the next thing is to, once you're on WordPress, you have to design your website and themes, um, are kind of the blanket term for, um, kind of the template that is used to build what your website looks like. Um, so there are lots of lots and lots and lots of places to build websites. You can get a lot of free themes on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and I, like I said, I have resources at the end where I've given you a few of our favorites that can help you with that. There are free options and paid options. Um, but the big thing that I want you to come away with it when you are building out the design and the theme and the look of your website, you have to make sure that it is mobile friendly, which means it can be seen across everybody's device. So not only does it look good on desktop, but it needs to look good on phones and tablets as well. And that's what mobile friendly or being responsive is called. Um, and then also it needs to be a fast page. It needs to be um, optimized for site speed. Um, so that means if you, have you ever been to a web page and like it takes six or seven seconds to load and you're like, I'm over it already. Right. So you need to be looking for a theme that is built, um, to be fast from the get go. Um, and like Amber said, also a, a theme that is built to, um, make sure that it's got all the things that you need built into it so that when somebody searched for something related to you on Google, that you come up and search. Yeah. And I know just based on the questions, you know, people are like, oh no, technology, there are definitely companies that will help you with this. Um, it starts with your hosting. Don't be scared or think that you have to, to block yourself out of this because you're not technology minded. As someone that works with 4,000 different bloggers, I will tell you that people who understand how their website works and, and what actually happens under the hood um, are in the, the very minute minority. Um, maybe 1% <laughs> mm -hmm. of our bloggers understand what actually happens on their website underneath all the technology. Um, so there are companies that you can hire to help you with this. Um, don't, don't be scared of, of that part of it. It's, it's really about figuring out what the hundred dollar job versus the $10 job is. If understanding the technology is the $10 job, hire it out. So don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm not in that 1% that understands. At all. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next step is to, once you've got your website set up, right, and this, this is not going to be a quick process. It's going to take some time for you to do the first two steps, and that's okay. Um, so once you've got your website set up, you want to establish a content and publishing calendar. So what that means is, um, I like to think of things at a year at a time, and I know that kind of seems like a lot, but as a food blogger, Kind of my yearly themes come along with the seasons, right? So if a year doesn't work for you, then don't think of things in a year at a time. But I really suggest that you think about working a few months in advance. So you're not saying, oh, I haven't posted anything this week. I have nothing to write about. But if you know you've got a schedule where you're going to post once a month or once a week, or you want to post every day, you can work 
forward and start planning your topics and start planning out when that that is going to happen for you. Um, so then you don't become so overwhelmed and bogged down with trying to get things published right away. Um, and then finally, we've talked about, you know, search a lot, but we, it's super important to have a plan in place for how you're going to get after you've published your stuff out to the world and searchable. And this is one of the things where I would recommend having somebody help you with it. If this is one of those things where you're super not like we're tech challenge, you know, well, go to, go to the Mediavine blog. Uh, which I have, I have linked at the end, and there are tons of things that you can read about and how to get your 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 blog like coming up in searches. So there's lots of information on the web, and we'll point you in the right direction to where to start. But it's really important that you have some kind of a know-how and plan if you want to make a business out of this to to make your blog optimized for search. Um, okay, so here are a few of the resources. There's a larger list at the end, um, and I'm not going to go into all of these um, in great detail. I, I do want to note that um, I, I mentioned briefly that I'm in a few online um, groups and posting on Facebook. So there are blogging groups for all kinds of bloggers that you can join on Facebook. And I know that there's military influencer groups as well. There's actually a military influencer conference, which will be in Washington, D.C. next year. So there's a, already a community of military bloggers set up. And so just find them on Facebook and the internet and get plugged into them. Okay, so, and that, that kind of goes into Amber's, kind of, Amber, what Mediavine does is kind of, you know, make what you have work harder for you. And so by setting these kind of, setting up the foundation for your blog, you're gonna make what you have do all the work for you and work harder for you. So if you start with these things, um, it's going to be a lot easier than what I did was start as a hobby blog and try and figure it out later. Um, so really think about these four steps when you get started and really take the time to get them set in place. Right. Really what you're hearing from both Betsy and myself here is if, if we could go back and tell our 10 years younger selves how to go about this, um, this is what we would do differently is we would, we would start with these things, these core values in mind, so that as we go to write about the things we're passionate about, we, this stuff is stuff we don't even have to think about. It's a lot harder to do that in reverse and try and apply these things to a website that already exists and content that already exists. If you think about like me, I've been food blogging. I've got over a thousand recipes on my blog and I only started doing these optimization things maybe four years ago maybe um, so even think about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blog posts that I've already written that I had I have to go back now and I'm still working on going back and optimizing them if I would have started from the beginning um, it would have been a lot easier <laughs> um, so Betty asked how much of all of this cost set cost to set up um, and it really just, it depends on um, the hosting, that the hosting plan that you, that you purchase, which is, you know, where your website lives. Um, that can be anywhere from $10 a month to $40 or $100 a month, depending on how big, um, how big the plan is. Um, right. and or also, what they're doing for you as well. Right. Like, for example, on the last slide, we one of the people that we listed was Agathon for hosting. And I think their smallest package is like $60 a month, but they do everything for you. So as you're talking about, well, I want to do this, but I don't have a technical brain, having a what, what's called managed hosting by a company like Agathon that will literally do everything for you. And you say to them, I want this. And they say, okay, it's done. That peace of mind, um, it, to me, is worth that $60 a month. Um, whereas you can go to a company like Bluehost, which is like $4 a month, but the minute there's a problem with your website, they're like, oh, you have to pay us $250 for us to fix it. So it really comes down to what you want to do as you start. You know, do you want to have a, a partner that you know you can rely on, or do you just want to kind of get everything going and then move to something once you start making money? All of that is possible. You don't have to stick with the host that you start with. Um, you can also even start with, I think it's WordPress.com that's free, isn't it? Yeah. Or is it WordPress.org? 
I can never remember which is which. I don't remember either. Okay. <laughs> one, there are two WordPresses and one of them is free. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, Amber, I'm going to move on because we still have a lot yes. of stuff to go through. Okay. And okay. I want okay. So quickly, I'm going to go through my blogging workflow. Okay. So just to give you an idea of what I do as a blogger. So I choose a topic. I, I write and take photos. I think about search, post it out the, on the internet, and then I distribute it across all my social media platforms. So for every blog post I write, that's kind of my workflow for it. Okay, so we're going to talk about storytelling, and this is going to relate into once you actually get into the writing of your blog, okay? And Colleen, I see your question about intellectual property, and we'll get to it at the end, okay? Um, okay, so some of the most successful companies in the world have profound stories behind them that instill a bigger sense of purpose and meaning into what, into what they do. So when you see these logos, you'll see Nike, Dove, and even ones with Dove Foundation. When I see the Dove logo, I always think of those commercials of um, the women in their underwear of all different sizes, and I have an emotional connection to that. When I think of Nike, I think of their, their commercials, the Just Do It commercials, the inspirational stories they tell of their athletes. Um, and when I think of the foundation, I think of these videos that they're putting together of all the caregivers that really tell their stories, right? So these companies are doing a really good job of tugging on our heartstrings and telling stories in a really good way. And that's what I want you guys to be able to do through your blogs. So <clears throat> you can um, see on this next slide, I just kind of lay out a little bit more of what I've said. Um, it just, it's, it's a really great way to take your brand and add an emotional component to it that really will connect to your audience. Um, and I know that our lives are one great big story, right? And our lives, we could probably have a different story for something that's happened almost every day in our lives to caregiver. And so to be able to turn that into a blog post through a story is really good, is what's going to be, um, really key to becoming successful as a blogger. Okay, so this next slide, I want you to just, this was a recent quote that um, Senator Elizabeth and Bob Dole put out about President Bush. So just take a moment to read it, and I know we've all probably read it before. Um, it's a great quote. I love it. Um, let us remember to see the humanity in each other, take the time to understand. Okay, we, we love it. Great. So the next slide, I want to show you, see if you can see the difference between this one and the next slide. So somebody tell me what's the visually, what do you notice about between the first and second slide? Uh, there's an emotional connection because of the photograph. Um, Perfect, yeah. Colleen. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'll go back to the other slide real quick and you can see it's a block of text, right? And it's, it's not easy for our eyes to read, okay? And then I'll go back. And now you can see that I've broken up the text a little bit into easier chunks to be able to read that have included the, a visual component to it. So Colleen, you're exactly right. The visual component of the, the Doles and President Bush kind of elicits that emotional response. And, and that's what we want to do with our storytelling. It's more than, your blog is more than just words on a screen, okay? It's, it's a story in which to be told. Steph says the second slide visually draws you in and you want to read the text, not skim it. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That makes me very happy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Amber, can you talk a little bit about um, forgetting everything you learned in English class? Yeah. So guys, when a lot of us, I mean, I'm, I'm almost 40. I know that you know, it's hard for me as a person that was taught how to write in English class. Um, to write for the web. Writing for the web is very different. Um, on devices, uh, you know, Apple, Google, Facebook, they've all done studies to see how people read on their devices. And the truth is that they don't read like books. They skim. They, you know, they pull out what they can. And so if there's a giant wall of text, like what was on that first slide, 
you don't, it, it's very hard for your brain to comprehend it, to, to actually read it in the order that it's written and to comprehend. Betsy and I were talking about this yesterday when we were going through the slides. It took me like five tries to read that first slide and actually take in what it said. Whereas the second slide, I know what it says in about 30 seconds, the 30 seconds it took me to read it. And the reason for that is that the text is broken up into digestible chunks. I can scan it and still get the meaning behind the text out of it. Um, that is how we read on our devices. And if you've ever been on a website that where the text takes up the entire space of your mobile phone screen, um, I think you will, and I'm sorry if you can hear my baby monitor, my two-year-old's home today. Mm -hmm. um, if you... Um, if you've ever had text that takes up the entire screen, you really kind of check out. You don't, you don't comprehend what that person has written. And so writing for the web is really kind of taking everything that your English teacher taught you about spacing and paragraphs and tossing it out the window. Um, on the web, uh, your paragraph should be no longer than one to two sentences, um, which is just for a lot of people, it's like, wait, what? Um, but really the best way to go about doing this is when you're writing something for the web, read what you're writing out loud to yourself. And every time that you stop to pause and breathe, hit return. Um, that will get you into a routine of breaking up what you're writing in ways that uh, visually a web reader can take in. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, like I said, I'm working with Operation Gratitude. They've been blogging pretty old school for um, a long time, and I'm trying to get them to break that habit. But, um, you know, if you go look at my blog, for example, you'll see just that, that it's a whole bunch of tiny little sentences with pictures in it. And um, that goes to our next point. Um, you know, like you saw with <clears throat> that, the, the block of text from the Doles versus with the photo, you know, it, a photos are an important part of your storytelling and they need to be included within, within your blog post. Um, so there is a picture of my brand new little baby puppy dog, Corgi. His name is Donut. Um, but you, if I were talking about my family and how I just got a new dog and included that photo in it, it would give you an emotional response versus not having that photo at all. So you want to think about when you're writing to include photos as much as you can into your writing. And Amber, how many pictures should we be including in our blog posts? <laughs> well, this quote comes right from, from the Mediavine blog. Uh, this post was actually written by my co-founder, Eric, who's kind of like my pesky little brother. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, we always say, um, include lots of photos and the joke is as many as you possibly can, but really what we mean as many as your content will justify. So if you're talking about, you know, going to an event uh, with the foundation and you got all of these great photos of people doing different things and you want to talk about them um, throughout your post, like you'll, you'll easily find ways to insert them into what you're doing. And it actually almost helps you tell the story. So, um, like for example, when, when Betsy or I write a food blogging post, I used to actually do um, the step-by-step -step photos and that would help me write the post because I, as I was inputting the photos into the post, I could um, write about what was in the photo. And that's exactly how you can write about what's happening in your own life and, and being a caregiver and things like that. If you're documenting your life on Instagram or even just taking pictures of your your family as you go along, like there are things that you can pull in that will give you that, that engagement and that, that feeling that donut gives me because golly, I want a puppy. <laughs> um, and that's the exact sort of thing that, that you're going for. You know, the, the old, the old joke is a picture's worth a thousand words. And the thing that I want from you as, as your ad management partner would be, I want the picture and I want the thousand words. Um, so that's what you're going for here. Okay, so we're going to do a very quick, because we're almost out of time, little um, exercise, okay? And this is just to get you started. This is going to be super quick. Um, so like I told you guys before, you're going to be thinking about your potential audiences, okay? 
And what I want you to do is just take one minute to brainstorm as many potential topics as you can for your blog. Now, it could, you don't have to write about caregiving. This can be whatever you want your blog to be about. But just start brainstorming and writing down as many as you possibly can right now. And we'll go for about a minute, and then we'll come back. Okay, so now I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear what some of your ideas are. So if you're interested in sharing, either write them in the group chat or take yourself off mute and share one or two of your ideas. So who wants to go first? Hey, Betsy, it's me. Hi. Um, I would like to write about love as a force for change and for military caregiving and social justice. Okay. 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 Uh, and using literature uh, to help with our mental health. So what we read and what we what we take in. Um, and then, um, of course, cycling. There has to be something with cycling. I love to cycle. Um, but then also um, using my love language. Like I love to, um, one of the things I, I love to do is cook. So this kind of fits in really well with Media Vine and Betsy, <laughs> but um, but how I use that as a form of bringing our family together and sharing through trials, tribulations, and like resiliency. Great, those are all great places to start, Colleen. That's okay, really, that's really great. Those are all perfect. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, and and I love how um, you know all of those are kind of diverse topics, but they all fit under the brand of Colleen. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's how you can establish yourself as a brand. You can write a lot about a lot of different things, but it's all coming from your point of view, which makes it your brand and unique. And can I just ask one question before everyone starts to share? Because I was thinking about naming my blog Colleen Inspired, just so I could do all of those different things under that. Okay. I love it. Great. Okay. So in the chat room, um, oh, bye, Jessica. Thanks for joining. Have a good day at work. Um, so in the chat room, we've got Steph saying, maintaining the marriage romantic relationship when you're a caregiver. Awesome. Um, Amanda says, mindset, how to approach obstacles in a healthy manner. Um, Steph also says, how to deal with help, well-meaning people that aren't really helping. Um, and Elizabeth says, how veterans are adopting and raising grandchildren. I love that. Yeah, these are all really great topics that, you know, first thing that comes to my mind is there are other people out there that will want to read this. So we as a community have so much to share based on our personal experiences that I'm looking at this list going, I want to read every single one of those because I'm going to take something out of it that I can use towards my life. So this Absolutely. Is and I mean, honestly, that last one, like I actually have a friend in my life who just adopted their grandchildren and they're not military, but they would read it. Yeah. Right. Because Absolutely. there's, there's some themes there that are going to be consistent, whether you are military or not. Yeah. I love this. I love it. Um, okay. So the next thing real quick is take your, take the one topic that you um, are resonating with the most with your, with your list that you wrote. And I just want you to spend the next minute free writing on that topic. So what free writing means is I want you to just write whatever comes to mind, whether you're bullet pointing out other things that you want to include in it, or you actually just start from the top and you start writing it in paragraph style. I don't care what it is. So we're going to spend one minute on the one topic that resonates with you and just free write as much as you possibly can. Um, and let me set my timer and go ahead and start. Okay, so now I'm only going to ask because we're running short on time. Um, I just want one of you. So if some one of you would like to share what you wrote about briefly, I'd love to hear it. Anybody? Jennifer, I see you smiling. Do you want to share? Sure, I'll share. Okay. Um, so like the two sentences I wrote down was finances is not a fun topic between spouses, but it's a much needed topic of discussion to plan for the what if or retirement. Yeah, that's like a great, 
hook. It brought me in already. I wanted to learn more. Um, and yeah, I love it. So <clears throat> when I start thinking about writing, um, I do this a lot. Like when I'm trying to think about like different, cause I do recipes. I don't really write about caregiving, but I start by just doing this is I write down stuff I'm thinking about or feeling or things that I want to make. And then I do what we just did and kind of write a little bit more about it. Um, so just doing that free writing will allow you to kind of just start getting the thoughts and ideas out um, without, um, you know, kind of worrying about the formality of what a blog post should be written like or should look like. Um, so great job, Jennifer. That was that was amazing. Thank you. Um, uh, Amanda, I'll share what you wrote. Um, Amanda wrote veteran widows. The general public is so ignorant when it comes to veteran widows. They don't automatically start getting a check. They do not have everything taken care of. The funeral is not always paid for. So quit acting like veteran widows have it made and they are lucky. Um, so yeah, that was, I, I love that you were able to get your emotions out in this free writing. Um, and I, I'm glad that you shared that, Amanda, because sometimes our emotions um, when, we're, when we're writing can be really, really heightened, right? So if we're able to do some free writing first, we can take those emotions that we got back on paper and really kind of sink them into something that would be really great for a blog post. Um, so it's okay to share your emotions, but at the same time, we don't want to come off as, um, you know, whiny or complaining, but we do want to come off as sharing our point of view in a constructive way. Um, so free writing will allow you to get your emotions out and then format them in a way that's going to be um, really great for your readers. Great, you guys. Um, Angela, raise your hand. Did you have a question, Angela? Uh, I was the one thing that I, I thought that I would blog about, and I'll just say real quick was uh, marriage and relationships as a caregiver after 50. Because you, there's a lot of things that you have to deal with when you're on the other side of the, you know, just as well as any age. But when you get to a certain point in your life, there are other obstacles and things that you have to deal with uh i guess from a sexual education point of view yeah mm -hmm. i love that angela i mean we've got such a diverse group here that i can see a dozen different blogs coming from a dozen different angles all with information that's going to help not just our community like amber said but a lot of this will will um, pass over to other communities as well um, okay, so here's the burning question that I know you're probably all asking yourselves. How do you make money from blogging, right? I mean, yeah, Jennifer, I see you. Yep, you're like, yeah, tell me how. I want to know, right? Um, so my blog didn't start off making money. Okay, so my blog started off as a hobby blog, and I added some Google ads to it in the beginning when I didn't know any better, and I was making pennies, right? And, and it just it wasn't, it wasn't worth my time. Um, but that's why Amber is here because Amber, um, okay, Amanda, I'm going to, I'm going to, Amanda said, I don't want it to cost anything. Well, if you get to the point where your blog makes you a hundred bucks a month, then the blog will pay for itself. So that's the best thing about it. When I started, even just the smallest amount of revenue that I could make, it would end up paying for itself. So it might cost you something in the beginning, but if you do it like this, in the end, it's going to pay for itself. Absolutely. Uh, it's going to pay for itself and then some. Yeah. I mean, the important thing is you can't invest and take this seriously um, without treating it like a business. And businesses have to spend money to make money. Um, and I mean, even the IRS expects that a business will not be profitable in its first or second year. Um, based on what my accountant told me when I started Blue Bonnet Baker. I, I claimed a loss for the first couple of years. That's because I bought myself a new computer. I bought myself a camera, um, things that were deductible to the business expenses. But I did, and hosting is deductible. I mean, all the things that you spend money on, they actually, um, you actually get to claim them against your business uh, tax return. So Amber's so, going to go straight into the three different ways you can make money. Yeah. So um, I obviously I work for a display ad management company. We do display advertising. Uh, Betsy has uh, provided a visual explanation of what those are so you can see them. We've seen them on every website from CNN to Java Cupcake to um, 
I mean, you name it, it's got ads on it. There's very few websites that don't have ads on it these days. Um, display advertising is a passive way for you to earn money for views of your content. A lot of people think that ads have to be clicked on to make money. That's not the case anymore. Um, so long as you have eyes on your ad, you'll get paid for it. Um, so the nice thing is that you don't have to be convincing someone to buy something in order to make money from ads. Um, you want to go to the next slide, Betsy? Okay. Uh, the next is influencer marketing. We talked about being an influencer, right? Like Kim Kardashian is an influencer. You think she's talking about that weight loss supplement out of the goodness of her heart. I've got some news for you. Uh, she's getting paid behind the scenes and she's supposed to disclose that per the FTC. She, and I think they've actually gotten in trouble for that recently. Um, there's nothing wrong with getting paid to endorse a product that you know and love. Um, you know, we see people like um, Sandra Lee from the Food Network endorses stuff. Like the, there's nothing, if you are using a product in your daily life and you love it and that company comes to you and says, we would like to pay you to talk about this in a concerted way. Um, that's what influencer marketing is. Um, so you're not necessarily getting paid to convince people to buy stuff in like a transaction per transaction way. You're getting paid to give that brand access to your loyal audience through blog posts, your email list, or through social media. You can see that photo on the slide is actually from my blog. And I, that was with the kitchen brand, um, OXO, and I was already going to be making cookies. And so I partnered with them and they sent me the supplies and paid me. And then I organically was able to put them into my blog post. But now somebody that comes to my website and sees that they want to make these Fritz cookies, they're going to know that I used the OXO products to, to make it, but it's coming off in an organic kind of way. And I already right. love their products. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm putting, I'm organically putting it into the content that I'm sharing. Um, right. And I can see that happening in the caregiver community as well. Um, you know, just uh, Austin in the Facebook group asked about technology that we're using um, as caregivers. And I can see technology companies actually have been approached by some apps, um, app technology companies, you know, um, you know, you're writing about things that are helping you in your life and an app company comes to you and says, hey, would you like to try our app? You could potentially create a partnership with them. If you're using um, it in your life as a caregiver, that could be something where you say, hey, I'd, I'd love to try it out, but maybe we can turn this into a partnership where, you know, we create a sponsored partnership together, they pay you, and then you talk about it across your platforms. And then right. you would kind of organically work some of those things into your world as a blogger. Right. And Steph asks, do you go to that company and ask, or do they come to you? And it actually happens both ways. Mm -hmm. Or you even have a company like mine that sort of sits between and goes to a company like OXO and says, hey, we have 4,000 bloggers that you can work with. Um, would you like to do a sponsored campaign with us? And we handle all the heavy lifting of matching them with the right bloggers and getting the, the content made and all of these things and um, basically becoming an agent for you. And so you're not doing any extra work to have to reach out to those brands and stuff like that. We're doing that for you. We take a small percentage of what they're paying you. And there's actually plenty tons of companies that will do this for you. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can do it, or you can approach them yourselves. It's just sometimes the back and forth of that can be very time consuming. So it can be a lot easier to just get a company to do it for you. And finally, Amber, Finally, you've got affiliate marketing. So a lot of people, you'll, you'll see people talking about a product that they use. Um, and there's like when you, there's a hyperlink on the name of the product. And when you click on it, it goes over to Amazon. Um, or you'll see like hosting stuff or blogging tools. Basically, anytime you're endorsing a product through a trackable link, um, what happens is if the reader then makes a purchase, you get a small percentage of that purchase back. Um, Amazon is actually one of the most popular. Target actually also has an affiliate marketing program, um, those kinds of places. And so even if they don't buy the product that you link to, um, the little what's called cookie stays with the person for I think it's 24 hours. Um, and so if they make a purchase from, say, Amazon in those 24 hours, you get a commission on the sale. 
Um, and so affiliate marketing, again, there's a little more work than, um, than say display advertising because you're trying to convince someone to buy something. But if you've kind of got a flow set up, it's not a lot of work to, to add um, affiliate marketing to how you make money. I've seen um, successful, successfully done with bloggers through Amazon. You can create an Amazon store and mm -hmm. you know, list it on your website. So again, if there are products that you're using as a caregiver, you can create an Amazon storefront and you can list those things on your, on your blog and website as well. As an right. And it basically becomes a resource page because you're, you're talking about how you're organically using it in your daily life. And then you've got a resource page for people who are in the same boat as you to be able to find those things. And you can see as the example on the slide is that um, I have a friend that owns um, a cupcake liner company and she makes cupcake liners and sprinkles. And I exclusively use her stuff because I love it. But because I, that's the only product I use, I like to share that with other people. So on my sidebar on my website, I, that's the only affiliate link that I have on my website. So every time somebody clicks on it or I mention it in one of my blog posts, then I get a small commission from what they purchase um, of cupcake liners. And basically it pays for my cupcake liner habit. <laughs> but some people through their Amazon stores make a lot of money off of it because oh, yeah. it's a significant income source. Yeah, you can absolutely make thousands of dollars a month, depending on the size of your audience and stuff like that. So um, one thing we wanted to talk about is audience, right? So display advertisers and companies that use influencer marketing um, want to reach a specific kind of consumer. Um, even in display advertising, they want to reach a specific kind of consumer. Lifestyle websites a caregiver website would reach the exact kind of consumer that they want to reach, which is usually um, women in the 25 to 45 range or millennials. Um, those are the audiences that advertisers pay the most money for. Um, so writing to an audience that you know and love because you are one of them um, is the best way to actually turn your blog into a business um, and get brands and advertisers paying you for access to those people through these various means that we talked about. So when should you monetize? So this is going to sound really weird. I'm an ad person sitting in front of you saying, don't put ads on your site until it's worth it. Um, you only get one chance at a first impression and ads, I'm going to sit here and say it, ads suck. My company, personally, we believe that we make them suck less. Um, but no matter what you do, ads are going to cause a small amount of loss in user experience. So until those ads are worth it, are worth it to the audience you're trying to build into a loyal following, don't put ads on your site. Um, but in sort of congruence with that, your blog is a business, even if you're not turning a profit profit. Please don't think of it as anything other than that. Don't talk yourself down from the fact that it's a business if you're not earning money yet. Um, someone asked earlier, like, what are the possible payouts for a business like this? And I can tell you as someone who works with bloggers that um, are at the very smallest of our joining threshold to millions and millions of page views, um, it can be anywhere from 500 to two and a half million dollars a month. Guys, like I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's how small or how big it can get. Um, and it really, you just have to go into it thinking like a business and treating it like a business and knowing that if you put the effort and the love out there to be authentic and find your audience that resonates with you, um, then you can do this. You do not have to have an LLC to have a profit driven blog, but it does help. Um, just in terms of like liability and filing taxes and stuff like that, but it's not required by any means um, to have an LLC. Yeah. Jennifer, that's a great question. So a lot of us that are thinking about blogging also may naturally be good public speakers, right? So we naturally may want to share a story. So for me, I do have an LLC under Greek Creative Consulting, but that's because I do a lot of things, right? So um, like if you're thinking of yourself as a brand, you don't just have to stay to blogging, right? If you're thinking of yourself as a brand, you maybe you're going to write a book 
or maybe you're going to do public speaking, or maybe you're going to teach workshops, teach, teach workshops, or maybe you're going to do community organizing within your community, or maybe you're going to do lobbying. Um, and so all of those things can fall under your brand. So if you are thinking in that larger picture of wanting to become your own brand, then I would suggest looking into being an LLC. And that's something else that I can talk to you offline. It's really not difficult to do at all. Um, there's a small fee depending on which state you live in. Um, but you know, if you are seriously considering turning you into a brand and doing all of these things, then I would suggest becoming a, a formal business. You'll get, you know, an employee identification number with the, the IRS and, you know, it won't be done underneath your social security number anymore. You'll have your own business. And as caregivers and military spouses and family members as well, you know how often we move and travel and life changes. But if you're your own brand, then you have been, you'll be self-employed from the day that you started. So if you say today that you're starting this as your own brand, then this is day one of your new business. So I, I can say I've been in blogging for 10 years, um, but I've been in my LLC business as a self, you know, as a business owner for the last two years when I started my LLC, but my LLC started and I was, I mean, I just, I was doing small consulting things on the side for a hundred dollars here or there. But I still considered myself a business. I'm still an entrepreneur business person. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely worth talking to um, an accountant about as to what they feel is the easiest and most straightforward way. And you will encounter accountants that have no idea what a blog is or how you could possibly make money at it. Um, and so ask around. Betsy may have, you know, some recommendations. I know when I first went to my accountant when I was living in New Jersey and said, I have this LLC um, and I have a website and he goes, you have a website. How do you make money from that? And I was making, you know, a thousand dollars a month, um, in various different aspects. You know, I wasn't just doing, um, advertising on my website. I was doing recipe development for brands that was, that lived on their websites. I was selling my photography. I was, you know, all kinds of stuff. There are all sorts of avenues that you can, make money at this that don't necessarily have to do with the words that you're putting on the page. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's just something to step back and think about and think about the big picture. Are you good at taking pictures? Are you good at telling a story? Are you good at public speaking? Are you good at teaching people stuff? I know one of the things that I did in New Jersey, I actually taught cooking classes and I filed that under my blog income because it directly funneled into people getting to my website because they were coming to my website to look for cooking classes. So, you know, there's lots of stuff that you can think about in terms of that. So that pretty much wraps up. I'm sorry we ran over, but it was really awesome. I really wanted to get that free writing and blogging and that, you know, that time for us to kind of talk a little bit about what you're thinking about in as well. Um, but you know, that's what we kind of shared with you today is really, like I said, the high level overview of kind of blogging for, you know, starting out blogging to, if you've already got a blog, how you can make what you already have work for you better. Um, and I know we've um, answered a few of the questions, most of the question, I was just going to get to that stuff. Thank you to answer Colleen's question about intellectual property. Amber, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. So a lot of people think that because it's on the internet, it's free. That is not the case. Um, but I will say that the internet works a little bit differently in terms of um, worrying about this. So if you say, for example, have a brand that wants to use your intellectual property on their own website, so long as they're giving you credit and giving you a link back to your website, that is actually equity that they are placing uh, an authority that they're placing on your website. And a lot of times it's worth it to do that. Um, you, there, there are mechanisms to get someone to pull down your intellectual property that they've taken. But I will tell you as someone who has had a lot of content taken, 98% of the time, it's not worth your time to mess with it other than asking them for a link back. Um, just because that helps your website grow. Um, We've actually had several bloggers um, in our in our Facebook group that report going to places on vacation and finding local businesses that have used their photos for like menus and stuff. Um, one went to Puerto Rico on vacation, found a like a 
street side cart that she was like, wait, that's my photo. Um, somebody else just came back from Ireland and a pub was using her photos on their menu when she called them out on it. The owner said it was on the internet. It's free. And the thing is, there's not like it's it's infuriating but there's not it's not worth your time to fight unless it's something like you know craft stole a photo of your melting cheese like that's not okay that's a company that no knows better um you can copyright words um it's automatically copyrighted your photos and your words are automatically copyrighted um one thing that Betsy and I deal with all the time, recipes are not able to be copyrighted. Um, List of ingredients, definitely not. Um, Actual methods are copyrightable. Photos are copyrightable. Um, But if someone takes your recipe and changes three ingredients and writes, rewrites the recipe in their own words, like the actual method, there's literally nothing you can do. So this is one of those things where the internet grew faster than the legislation around it. And it's not worth making yourself crazy. So if you're starting this out with that in mind, like I I would ask for you to um, maybe take a step back and realize that it's worth getting your words out there and not worrying about who's going to take them, especially in a a caregiver situation. I think it's a lot harder. People are not going to take that from you because obviously it's your... um, it's pictures of your family or it's pictures of your experience at an event. Like I find, I wouldn't find people taking that as much as like say Betsy and I run into with recipe and craft blogs um, because there's an actual like piece of collateral that they can take and use. Um, And it's, and it could be their experience or not their experience, but you wouldn't know the difference. Whereas in a caregiver blog, you're going to know the difference. Um, So that would be my thought on that. Are there any other questions that people have? No? Looking in the chat. Great. This is awesome. You guys guys Uh, have really great questions. So I just want to thank you for all your great questions. Um, And I'm I'm hoping that you guys learned um, learned some stuff here. And, um, you know, find me on the internet, you know, and find me, Amber and Mediavine, um, all across the internet. Um, and you'll see, um, on the, I'll send you, um, I'll send the presentation to Liz and she'll make it available to everybody. Um, but in this presentation, you'll see on this slide, there's links to, um, the Mediavine blog and that will give you a ton of information about how to make your blog work better for you. Um, everything from, you know, how to rank and search to the kind of images and the words that, you know, how to lay your posts out, all of that is laid out in the media Mediavine blog. Um, and, I, you know, I will be here for you to bounce ideas off of and to help you through this process. Um, and feel free to, you know, shoot me messages on Facebook or send me an email, um, and, and I'm, I'm here for you guys through this whole process. Absolutely. And Colleen asked if it's okay to reach out to me. It absolutely is. My email is amber at mediavine.com. Um, just know that I'm coming back from a 10 days away, so I may not answer. I'm still digging my inbox out. I may not answer right away, but I will answer. I promise. <laughs> you both did such a great job. Thank you so much for sharing today with us. I know that there was a lot of interest. And so I'll take this and share it on the Facebook group. Betsy, I'll share your slideshow. And so we'll we'll make sure that everybody gets it. Thank you, Liz. Did an awesome job. Hello, thanks for being here. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. And Betsy, it was Betsy's idea. So. (laughs) All right, you guys. See you later. All right. Bye, Bye, everybody.